10 unsolved mysteries from Scotland. There's no denying Scotland's rugged beauty and mystical Celtic charm. There's also a lot about the place that's baffling to outsiders. What do men wear under their kilts? Who thought bagpipes were a good idea? Do I even want to know what's in this haggis? These 10 mysteries are even weirder, and even the natives haven't been able to figure them out. Number 10. The Death of Annie Borgeson On December 4th, 2005, the body of Annie Borgeson, a 30-year-old Swedish woman, was discovered on the shore of Presswick, on the west coast of Scotland. Police quickly ruled it suicide by drowning, but Annie's family weren't convinced, and they uncovered some odd things when they looked into it. When Annie's body arrived back in Sweden, the undertakers there claimed she had several bruises that seemed to have incurred while she was still alive. The autopsy in Scotland hadn't recorded these bruises. There were other marks on her body too, which officials reported had concluded to be the result of collision with debris in the sea. What most concerned the family though were the unanswered questions about Annie's last day. Annie lived in Edinburgh, but on December 3rd she travelled 129 kilometres to Presswick Airport for unknown reasons. She tried to withdraw cash using her credit card twice, first 100, then 50. Both times, she didn't have enough funds in her account to complete the transaction. She proceeded to the airport, where her image was captured on video surveillance in late afternoon. Timestamps from the airport security footage showed that she moved the length of her terminal 55 seconds. Independent investigators determined that this should take over a minute and a half at normal walking speed and concluded that she must have been running. In total, she spent less than five minutes at the airport. According to a friend who had seen the footage, she appeared to be walking around looking annoyed and angry. She then began walking towards Presswick itself. She wasn't familiar with the town, which was about a mile away from the airport. A witness later claimed to have seen a figure standing on the beach near the sea, but the figure was too far away to identify. When Annie's family began the investigation, they hit a wall of secrecy. Scottish authorities refused to release tissue samples that would help clarify the cause of death. When the family accessed Annie's email account, they found that all of her emails had been deleted. A friend named Maria Janssen discovered that Annie's phone company had failed to register any of the calls she had made to Annie during 2005, and the phone company refused to discuss it with her. Maria began to frequently receive silent phone calls. Family members had problems with their email accounts. Police claimed that there were no records of any calls to or from Annie during her last three days, even though several people remembered talking to her. It later came to light that Annie's hair had been cut after her death and thrown away. Annie's family continues to campaign for a full investigation. Her mother has met with the First Minister of Scotland and a petition of 3,000 signatures was presented to the Scottish Parliament at the end of 2003. The family wants the police to investigate the possibility that Annie was killed during the missing 16 hours between the time she left the airport and when her body was found. Number 9. Who Hanged Mark Devlin? In the 1830s, a ruthless gang of criminals who called themselves the Black Band dominated the city of Dundee. Since Dundee only had 14 police officers, it wasn't difficult for the band to indulge their penchant for robbery and rioting. The law got a break in 1835 when they caught a black band member named Mark Devlin breaking into a property and decided to make an example of him. Devlin was tried and sentenced to death by hanging. That was a bit of a problem though because Dundee didn't have a hangman. Hanging had been used by the English to execute supporters of Scottish rebels so no one in Dundee wished to be associated with it. They arranged for the hangman to travel from Edinburgh and made a makeshift platform on the side of a local guild hall. When the executioner didn't show, officials scrambled to find a replacement. A man identified as local showman James Livingston volunteered, and Devlin was sent to meet his maker. Livingston's reputation tumbled quickly as a result, which didn't make him too happy, because Livingston had actually been 24 kilometres away in the neighbouring town of Forfar at the time. He had reliable witnesses who saw him there, and he was eventually able to persuade everyone that he wasn't present that he wasn't even present at Devlin's hanging. But who did hang Mark Devlin? Nearly 180 years later, we don't know and likely never will. Number 8. The Appen Murder 
On May 14, 1752, Colin Roy Campbell of Glenure was shot near the Scottish town of Appin. Campbell was not a well-liked man, as he was a government agent in charge of local evictions. He was killed when he was on his way to evict members of the local Stuart clan to be replaced with members of his own family. Eileen Stuart was the main suspect. He fled, but he was tried and sentenced to death in his absence. His brother James was also sentenced to death as an accomplice, even though an alibi placed James nowhere near the shooting. The case has been held up as a terrible miscarriage of justice. The head judge and 11 of the 15 jury members were from the Campbell clan. In 2008, a Scottish lawyer petitioned the government to have the sentence officially overturned, stating there was not a shred of evidence that the Stuarts had been involved. In 2013, modern forensic analysis determined that there must have been two gunmen that contradicted the report from the sole witness of the crime, who claimed to have seen a single shooter on a hill. According to research by author James Hunter, the shooter is a man named Donald Stewart. Hunter claims it was well known among many Stuarts at the time, but they did not want to give Donald up to the authorities, so they let James take the fall. He says the secret has been passed on through several generations over the years, while this particular case is still capable of stirring strong emotions among some Scots, it's likely to never be completely solved. Number 7. Gilmerton Cove A small cottage in the Edinburgh suburb of Gilmerton hides the entrance to an unusual mystery. Buried in the sandstone underneath the town's homes are a series of tunnels known as Gilmerton Cove. They are obviously man-made on top of the building-like layout, there are benches, seats and stairs carved from the stone, yet no one has any real idea who built them or why. A popular explanation, first recorded in 1769, is that the tunnel systems were carved by a blacksmith named George Patterson between 1719 and 1724. The idea is that it was a home and workshop, but there are good reasons to doubt this. The area supposedly identified as a fireplace has no blackening around it, suggesting nothing has ever been burned there. There exists what appears to be a well, but it never went deep enough to hit water. Another possibility is that it was dug in the 17th century as a trial bore to search for coal. There are some tunnels heading north that are blocked, but may once have reached the nearby Craig Miller Castle, suggesting that the cove could have been an escape tunnel. Some of the wilder suggestions include the idea that it was used as a hideaway by witches facing persecution. An archaeological investigation was carried out between 2000 and 2002 to determine once and for all what purpose the tunnel served. Sadly, its only conclusion was that the cove had been so widely used over the last few centuries, any chance of figuring out its origins are long gone. Number 6. The Meaning of Stones among the most popular types of art found across Scotland are ring and cup marks, which are patterns of concentric circles and lines carved into rocks. Some of the art may be as old as 5,000 years. The meaning of these patterns is lost to time, if they ever had meaning at all. A more recent art phenomenon found in Scotland are picked stones. These are relief sculptures carved into stone slabs similar to Egyptian hieroglyphs that depict people and animals. A statistical analysis of 200 picked stones from the 6th century concluded that they aren't simply pretty pictures, they represent a written language. The study, carried out by Exeter University, analysed how often certain symbols followed others and found a pattern that matched many known ancient languages. Unfortunately, the study didn't bring us any closer to understanding what the stones actually mean. The lead author of the research, Rob Lee, suggests they may be lists of the dead. The vocabulary used on the stone seems to be quite limited, and we may never know just what the picks were recording. Number 5. The Disappearing Ninth Legion The Roman army's Ninth Legion successfully conquered England in AD 43, and with the exception of the Odd Rebellion, kept control of the bottom half of Britain for the next 74 years. Then from AD 117 onward, the entire legion suddenly vanished from the historical record. Today, no one has any idea what happened to them. One of the most popular theories is that they marched north into Scotland to fight an uprising of the Picts. This story has gained traction in fiction as the basis of several books and films. But some historians believe the legion simply left to go fight elsewhere. 
It's also been speculated that they were defeated in a battle against Rome's nemesis, the Parthians in Iran. Another possibility is that they lost against a Jewish uprising in AD 132. One clue suggests that things had started to go wrong for the ninth even before that time. When Emperor Hadrian turned up in AD 122, he brought another legion with him, the sixth. He proceeded to build a wall across the north of England, then called Britannia, to keep out the people north of the border. If they had recently wiped out a renowned army of his military, that would have been a very good reason to erect such a structure. Number 4. The Missing Library of Iona In AD 563, missionary St. Columbia and his followers landed on the Scottish island of Iona. It was there that he founded a monastery, which became a capital of knowledge during the Dark Ages. Kings were buried there, and people made pilgrimage to benefit from, from the wisdom of the monks. The monastery there was filled with the best writings of the age, most of which have vanished. The only known survivor is the Book of Kells, which is preserved at Trinity College in Dublin. Many believe the rest were destroyed by Viking raiders who attacked in the 9th century, but some historians believe the books may have survived. They suggest that the books may be taken to Ireland or buried nearby to keep them safe. While archaeological digs on nearby islands in the 1950s proved fruitless, there's a chance that the missing knowledge could still be nearby. After all, the Dead Sea Scrolls are centuries older and a shepherd simply stumbled upon them in a cave. An immense written record may exist from a time period that gets its name from the lack of such a thing, but we simply don't know where it is. Number 3. The Fate of David Stewart David Stewart, the Duke of Rothsey, was an unfortunate victim of a royal family feud. His father was Robert III, the King of Scots. Unfortunately, when Robert took the throne in 1390, he lacked the backing he needed to rule effectively. Support among the nobility was for Robert's younger brother, Robert Stuart, Duke of Albany. That's not a mistake, both brothers were called Robert at that point. Robert III had been born John Stuart, but he changed his name to Robert when he became king. In 1399, David was appointed by his father to lieutenant of the kingdom. But his uncle wasn't too pleased about the young lad gaining so much power. In order to maintain his stronghold on Scotland, the young Robert had his nephew arrested in 1401. No one knows exactly what happened to David Stewart after that. It's believed he may have been starved to death in the dungeons. One story claims that he ate his own hands in a desperate bid to survive. The Duke of Albany claimed that David had simply died of dys dysentery. Either way, it's believed that he was buried in an unmarked grave in Lindor's Abbey, and the current owners of the land are using underground imaging in an attempt to locate the body. If they find it, they plan to use DNA to confirm it is the prince and set the record straight about how he died. Number 2. The Great Mall Plain Mystery There is very little that makes sense about the disappearance and death of Peter Gibb. On Christmas Eve 1975, just after he'd finished dinner and a bottle of clary in his home in the Isle of Mull, the former Royal Air Force flying ace announced he was going out for a flight in his Cessna plane. The staff and hotel guests suggested it wasn't such a good idea, to which she responded, I am not asking permission, I just thought it was a courtesy to let you know, I don't want a fuss. He left with his dining companion, Felicity Granger, a former university lecturer. She later reported that Gibb had given her instructions to stand at one end of the runway with torches to guide his takeoff. Multiple witnesses claimed two torches moved independently in ways that would require another person to be helping, though Granger claimed there was only her. Gibb took off, and shortly thereafter, a sleet storm rained down that would last for 72 hours. Gibb didn't come back. While his motives were baffling enough, the real mystery began four months later when Gibb's body was found on a nearby hillside. A pathologist ruled that he had died of exposure. There was a cut in Gibbs' leg but no other injuries. Tess also concluded that neither his body nor his clothes had been in contact with the sea, so he definitely exited the plane on land, but no one could find the plane. Mull is not a large island, about the same land area as Dallas, so the disappearance of the craft was quite troubling. A light aircraft matching the description was found in 1986 in the sea between Mull and the mainland, but the doors were locked and the plane had apparently crashed extremely hard. The wings were a significant distance away from the rest of the fuselage, 
It suggested the sort of impact that a person wouldn't get out of without serious injury. Two explanations have been suggested, neither of which sound likely. The first is that Gibb leapt from the plane while it was in mid-air above the hill. He landed on the hill without suffering anything worse than a cut leg, then lay down and died in the cold. The problem with that explanation is that the aircraft would have been left to fly itself into the sea while the doors somehow locked themselves. The other theory is that Gibb was working for MI5 and had to attend an urgent mission in Northern Ireland. He was captured by terrorists, somehow killed, without being injured in any way, and his body was planted back on Mull. The light aircraft found in the sea left out of that theory. Then again, it doesn't make much sense than the alternative. Number 1. The Glasgow Effect The people of Scotland have one of the lowest average life expectancies in all of Europe. This average is heavily skewed by the people of Glasgow, where life expectancy can be as low as 54 years in some areas. Poverty is a partial explanation, but there are plenty of cities in the UK that are just as deprived and experience a much lower rate of premature death. The usual candidates of smoking, alcohol and drugs are also significant factors. But Glasgow's life expectancy is inexplicably low, even when all of that is taken into account. This phenomenon has been called the Glasgow Effect, but no one knows what causes it. There are numerous competing theories, blaming everything from the weather to the local culture to political scheming from both sides of the spectrum. It's not just Glasgow, the figures for Scotland as a whole don't look great. Life expectancy has been increasing more slowly than in many places, as other countries that used to lag behind Scotland's rate shoot ahead. The reasons are no better understood than those behind the Glasgow effect.